Okay. I will start then. Hello, um, my name is Mike Spertus. I'm. Uh, hold on. Oh, the big one on the stand. I always tell my students that working with IT is much harder than programming. So please tell me if I get this wrong. How does this sound? Good. All right. We can get started now. My name is Mike Spertus. I'm a senior principal engineer at AWS. And I'm going to be talking about something we're releasing today, which is going to support C++ for the cloud. But before I do that, I want to go on my computer. And I have a program here. It's a program. It's called Central Limit Theorem. CPP. It doesn't matter too much what it does, but if you're interested, the central limit theorem says that if you take any probability distribution and you use it enough times, then the means will be normally distributed, even if the original distribution wasn't. Um, but what we're interested in this for is um, it does, I think, 250 billion operations, if I'm counting right. And I'm going to just kick it off now um, running, on, um, running on a regular machine. And it's going to do a demonstration of the central limit theorem. And while it's doing that, I'll get back to the presentation. But keep that in the back of your mind. I want to begin with an acknowledgment that this is joint work with Damien Ficino. Let me take one more try with this mic. All right. And I'm going to begin not by talking about C++, but by talking about the cloud. If this is a C++ conference, I don't know if people are familiar with the cloud. But don't worry, there will be plenty of C++. So first, I'm going to talk about the traditional approach for using the cloud, which for me means AWS um, in C++. Then we're going to introduce the new high-level enhancements for AWS and C++ and talk about where we are and what's next. So here's a brief introduction to the cloud. So the cloud you can think of as a new home for where you run your applications. right? You don't run them on a computer in your laptop or in your data center anymore, but storage and computed are compute are hosted in the internet where we don't know in the cloud, right? And this storage and compute is shareable with whoever you choose, wherever in the world you choose. Furthermore, it's almost infinitely scalable. So anything you do, you can get concurrency if 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, a million times, whenever you need. And your storage isn't limited by the disks on your computer anymore. It can be petabytes or uh, exabytes or whatever. Um, furthermore, the cloud is elastic. So you pay for what you use when you use it. Compute, storage, and concurrency are all elastic, and you pay by the millisecond or by the byte or whatever. And finally, it's managed, right? Remember, we said, where does it run? We don't know. It's in the cloud. That means it's not our concern. Maybe it's my concern, given where I work. But it's not your concern. 
right? So you don't have to worry about patching operating systems, replacing failed disks, if you have enough power going to a rack, things like that. That's all done by the cloud provider, not you. This is sometimes called serverless because even though there's really a server, you can pretend that there's not one. All right. Now, it is possible to just program in the cloud like you're programming a traditional application and lift and shift it to get in the cloud so you can take advantage of these benefits like not worrying about patching operating systems or the like. And this is a very common thing to do. It's often worthwhile, but it's not what I'm going to talk about because in addition to being able to run your traditional applications, the cloud enables new application architectures that take advantage of the kinds of facilities that are available. And in particular, you can, instead of compiling your application to a single executable, you can assemble it out of managed microservices. What do I mean by that? Well, microservices are the building blocks of modern cloud applications. So in a microservice-based application, each application is deployed and run separately. It can be built and deployed independently, typically each part of the application has a small time, as a small team running it, which is responsible for ownership of that one piece all the way up to deploying it as a service themselves. This microservice owns its own resources, is independently accountable for the service level that it will provide, and can be optimized around the cloud's elasticity. And a microservice-based application can have many benefits over running a single large monolithic application. And what it mainly centers around is the ability to have loosely coupled independent components. So because a large monolithic executable generally is a tightly coupled code base, that's very large, even in the millions or more lines of code, it can be very hard to reason about. In addition, it can be brittle and hard to modify because everyone wants to write things modularly, but if you're sitting all in the same program, do you ever violate that? Well, I don't know about you, but it's been known to happen on every programming organization I've ever seen. So finally, because you have to deploy your entire application at once, it becomes expensive to make a change because deploying a large application is a major undertaking. So this reduces velocity what I hear from a lot of teams is they tend to bundle up 200 changes at once and then deploy it. And now the newly deployed application doesn't work and nobody knows who's buying the donuts the next morning, right? You all know that if you break the system, you buy the donuts the next morning. So if you have a microservice, is that you build your app out of loosely coupled microservices, each individual service has a clear contract that's easy to reason about, easy to test, and the like. And by easy, I mean whatever I want easy to mean. So interpret that how you will. It can be tested thoroughly, and each microservice can be deployed rapidly independently of the large application for every single change. And if something goes wrong, you can just roll back the deployment of the service. And 
there are many, many processes for doing this that are now mature, like you can deploy one copy of it and route 5% of your traffic to it until you're more confident or the like. And again, you don't need to worry about coordinating really large engineering organizations usually. Instead, each component is managed by a small independent team. We have a rule you might have heard of at Amazon is that no software team is bigger than you can feed with two pizzas. And we do this because we use microservices-based architectures. So there are many microservices that are available that you can use as building blocks for your applications. We offer over 300 different web services. Some of these services are very large, high-level systems that do a lot. For example, Amazon Transcribe is a text-to-speech service. And one of my students used that as a, um, in their project to just generate um, speech by calling out to that service. In this talk, we're going to focus on fundamental compute and storage services that are much lower level, but central to what you build cloud applications on. But we would ultimately think this vision could apply to any cloud services. We're going to talk about two of the most widely web used web services on AWS. The first is Amazon S3, which is an object storage service for storing data in the cloud. And I'm saying AWS periodically in this presentation because this is the cloud I work in and I'm familiar with and we developed this library for. But this is mostly the same, you know, um, for any kind of for any kind of cloud. Although, you know, there are important individual differences, of course, but not at this level. Um, the other is going to be AWS Lambda, which is a compute service that runs functions in the cloud. Amazon S3 is a simple service for storing objects in the cloud. And in fact, S3 stands for Simple Storage Service. Now, don't be misled by the name, although I'm not going to go into it in this talk. S3 is very powerful and configurable as well as simple. So there are options for regions, replication, tiering, etc. And that's a case where maybe you look at the features and say, you know, is the AWS offering right for you or not, right? So storage is organized into buckets with globally unique names. Now, the good thing about this, I don't know if in back you can see that's a smiley face, is it ensures that every bucket can be uniquely identified by a human readable name you can give someone. Um, the frowny face says, if you want to name your bucket my bucket, you probably missed the boat on that. And then all the bucket does is it stores objects in it. AWS Lambda is our name for functions in the cloud, serverless functions, because they run code without your managing any infrastructure. You just upload the code as a zip file or a container image, and it becomes a disembodied function sitting in the cloud. Lambdas are scalable because they automatically respond to every execution request at any scale. So if you call it a dozen times a day, that's okay. If you call it 100,000 times a second, that's okay as well. 
they're pay as you go because you only pay for the compute time you used by milliseconds instead of by the amount of infrastructure that you provisioned to run it. I should caution um, AWS Lambda, right? This is not the Lambda you thought of for this conference. It is not the same thing as Lambdas in C++. Or if you're in cloud computing, if you think about the Lambda architecture, it's not that either. Today I learn there's only one letter in the Greek alphabet. So, um, how do you invoke a Lambda? Well, once you've uploaded the Lambda function to the cloud, you want to use it. And there are two ways to invoke it. One is via direct invocation. So you make an API call to say, run this function for me. Um, you can go to URL in your browser, and it'll run it based on the query arguments in the URL, or you can run it in the AWS console. The other way you can invoke a Lambda function is trigger it with events. So Lambda is automatically invoked when an event occurs, such as modification to an S3 bucket, uh, a new element being put in a queue, etc. And there are many, many AWS services that can act as triggers for Lambda, allowing you to coordinate the services. Now, if you call a lambda, what does the argument to the lambda look like? Remember, lambdas are not C++ lambdas. In fact, they are language agnostic. So they're called with a JSON map of arguments. So here I'm calling a lambda with an argument named word whose value is foo and an argument named count whose value is seven. And if the lambda is invoked not directly, but via trigger, it works the same way. The lambda is invoked with a JSON expression describing the event. So if you put an object in an S3 bucket, and you have a lambda function listening to that bucket, here is Here is what the invocation may look like. So you see it has an argument named records that's an array of things, and it gives you the bucket name, uh, the bucket's ARN, which is like the, you know, the more computer-readable designator for it. Um, what is the schema version? who generated the ID, the, what's the name of the object, we call that the key, what's its size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these arguments coming in give a complete description of the event that triggered them. Who's ready for some C++? Most of you. The, the rest of you, I do speak at cloud conferences, so <laughs> could do more. But this, there is more to the cloud than this. Like, you could maybe talk about the cloud for, I don't know, maybe an hour, right? But we don't have time for that. So we're going to go to C++. AWS does have a software development kit for C++. And the way it's built is AWS services have um, a description in something called Smithy that explains how the service is invoked and what it models the service. And Smithy is a language agnostic thing, and we generate SDKs for many programming languages from this on a continuous basis. 
So Smithy defines itself as an open source language for defining services and SDKs. And this enables all the AWS SDKs and the C++ one in particular to complete an up-to-date coverage of all 300 AWS services, each of which has a large feature set. And the SDK does leverage many modern C++ features. It uses smart pointers, it even has an AWS outcome class that um, I personally would like to believe was the inspiration for stood expected. Um, it was not, but um, it anticipated it anyways. And as a programmer, it gives you complete coverage of the functionality of all of these services, right? So what does programming in the cloud with these SDKs look like? Let's take a look at how you would put an object into a bucket. I feel like I should make this bigger. How's that? Better? I'll bet there's some way to collapse this. There we go. How's this in back? Thumbs up. Good. Although I'm worried if I can barely see the thumbs up and back, how you can see the letters on this, but go there. So here I go and um, I want to put an object in a bucket. So I create a client, an S3 client for it. And now I go and create a put object request object and we've put object request class for this. We'll set the bucket name of it. We'll set the key for the request which is the name of the object that we're putting there. Um, we go ahead and create a stream so we can stream the content into it. We do a little error checking. We set the body of the request to the stream. Um, we create an outcome, which you should think of like stood expected, um, as the result of making the put object call. And then we go and check if the outcome was successful um, or not. And then that's it. Let's look at how you would write a lambda function that increments its argument. Okay, well remember a lambda function is actually invoked with a JSON request, right? It's not the calling convention of the language, right? So I'm gonna have some handler function that takes an invocation request that's in JSON, and then I go and do JSON parsing of it to make sure that it has the form I want. I validate the JSON, and I can always return a failure in the outcome. If something is incorrect, um, eventually I figure out it's the right thing to do for incrementing. So. I find the number I want to increment in the JSON, and I go and say the results key is number plus one, and I've incremented it, okay, and then I have some logging and the like. And main just fires up the handler for me. So that's how I write a lambda function. And of course, then you do the work to upload and deploy it to the cloud, right? Because you have to get it in the cloud. Um, yes? Um, it's actually part of the, um, what's called the Lambda runtime for C++, which is, an independent thing on GitHub 
because when you install the SDK, you install it on client machines. So we wanted a separate installation, but you, you can find it easily. Okay, so how would I invoke my Lambda function? Well, what I would do is that's the declaration. Here's the definition. Um, no. There it is. Okay, well, what do I do again? Is I create a payload, I go ahead and write some JSON into the payload, and then I create a client, do client invoke of the request, I get an outcome, I check it, and I go ahead and I print the right stuff. And that's it, and now I return the actual value that I got. So that's how you would, that's how you would call the lambda function from your program. All right, so this is, as I said, it's fully functional. Um, it covers all the services. It uses things like smart pointers and the like. What more could you want, right? Well, is this the simplest function you ever saw for in incrementing a number? Okay, the room seems to be split on that. <laughs> I'm going to say it's possible to make it simpler, right? So the AWS SDK for C++ makes everything possible, but how simple are the common cases? You might have heard the phrase that a good library should make the simple things simple and the hard things possible, right? So how simple are the simple things? Well, in this example, writing an object S3 took about a dozen intrinsic lines of code to properly invoke create and validate the request, all right? By contrast, opening and writing a file takes two lines of code, and more importantly than the amount of code, it uses C++ interfaces that are designed to interoperate with your C++ program. So anything that expects an iStream or an OStream can take something from a file right, just like it can take it from the console, because there's a standard interface for it. With Lambda, writing, calling the Lambda function takes about 60 lines of code, including a lot of explicit manipulation of the JSON, right? By contrast, say you're doing a thread function, which is another kind of distributed compute, that takes uh, three lines of code to write and call it, and again, it benefits from meeting the expectations of you know, many clients in the library. So it satisfies the callable concept. It does static type checking of the arguments and the like. So who was at Monday's keynote with Bjarna? Yeah, so he had, he had an answer for how you make the simple thing simple and the hard things possible. He says, we don't subset the language because we don't think you have to sacrifice power, but instead we create abstractions. And that brings us to the next section of the talk, which are high level enhancements for AWS and C++. Right, so we saw above, um, while there are a lot of great capabilities in Lambdas and S3, they can be harder to use than a local function or storage. And the extra friction means 
that you're probably only going to use a cloud function or cloud storage when you have a reason to do so. Wouldn't it be great if they were so simple to use that you would put your functions in the cloud and your storage in the cloud unless there was a reason not to do so, right? And then you'd automatically benefit from the shareability, scalability, management, pay as you go, like it. Or um, is Bjarne Struster uh, almost said, what if cloud programming was just normal programming? Okay, disclaimer, Bjarne Struster did not say this. He said, what if generic programming was just normal programming? And that's driven a lot of the development of templates in C++. But I say, what if cloud programming were just normal programming? So we've been writing high-level abstractions on top of common microservices use cases in the style of the C++ standard library to be clean and concise, familiar to the programmer, and interoperable with your existing code. Um, and you don't have to live in the subset. The full Smithy model is available when needed. Today, we are announcing uh, high-level enhancements for AWS and C++ on AWS Labs. It's on GitHub. Uh, the good thing is you're, it's being announced here for you. The bad thing is it's an early preview release and you know, you're going to get all the day one issues on it. Uh, and indeed, there are known bugs and limitations, and the interfaces are not yet stable. But let's give it a spin, okay? So, um, if I want to write to S3, here is how I'd write an object into a bucket. First thing I do is I have to initialize our connection to the cloud. So there's an AWS API object that we created that's an RAII class. And you do that once in your entire program, right? And um, that connects you to the cloud. And then in your code, you can create an OS3 stream with a region, a bucket name, and an object name. Um, and then you can insert content in it. You can, and that's it. It's like it is with files or anything else. So now if you want to benefit from std format, you just insert std format of whatever you want. And we, that's actually how we always like to do our I.O. now. So, this is simpler and more in line with the standard library than before. Here's how to write a lambda function that adds two ints, right? Now, this is, you're going to be really impressed because adding two ints is much harder than incrementing. So I'm not lowballing this, right? So here I declare a function named add that takes two integer arguments and returns its sum. That's just a regular C++ function. I didn't define it any differently, but as this person asked, how do I set it up as the handler of requests? Well, I create a handler object and I pass um, uh, some kind of callable reference to the constructor of it. And then it can be called. So this is, not only much easier than our previous version, but it's not harder than other distributed programming code like thread functions or GPU functions that we've been hearing a lot about and the like, right? And in fact, 
what we'll come to is this enables some new paradigms for concurrency that are not based on threading. Here's how you'd call the lambda from your executable. Again, once in your program, you're going to create a connection to the AWS API, and you use our RAII class for it. You're also going to create a client for interacting with lambdas. That is usually one and done, although it doesn't have to be. And now, somewhere, you have to say that this function in my code maps to this function in the cloud, and here's its signature. So the most principal way to do that is say client.bindLambda, angle brackets, the function signature, and then give the name that the lambda is stored with in the cloud. Um, if Howard Hinnant was here, he would say don't use, don't use signature types and, you know, maybe we'll move away from them. I don't know. And now you can call it just like any other function. Now, um, it's not exactly as simple as calling a local function, but it's, the friction is greatly reduced and the type safety is improved and we already have some minimal async support and a convenience macro for doing that binding for you. It looks like you had a question. Well, there will only be one lambda named add in your account, basically. Um, so um, you can do that by name, but I agree there's, you should also have it doable by ARN, too. But remember, we want to make the simple cases simple. And if your function name and your lambda name are the same, well, then this convenience macro, I mentioned it to you, can take care of all of that for you. Okay, so now, here's an interesting thing. Let's say, yes. Yeah, I said there's some minimal async support in it, but I actually want to describe a different heterogeneous computing model that I think is more exciting than just saying you have an equivalent of stood async. So let's say you're calling um, the lambda many, many times a second. Well, part of the infrastructure of cloud functions is it will create a new instance of the cloud function if it's been called and there every other instance is currently running a request. So it will spin up many, many instances on demand, okay? So I don't know what's with this build. There's an asynchronous race condition on the build. So the point is you wouldn't just go to the cloud to add two numbers, right? Okay, adding two numbers was lowballing it, right? So instead, You'd like the advantage if you could have really big scalable things in the cloud and you can set the maximum concurrency so you don't get a big deal, but the default is pretty big. It's a thousand, right? Who has a thousand cores on their computer? Well, I suppose the HPC people here do. But you could turn it up to a million. It's okay. So in effect, this dynamically gives you burst core capacity as you need it. 
And we can think of this as a distinct approach to the shared memory concurrency that's taken by threads and GPUs. Now, while you could do an async, like other heterogeneous compute, such as GPUs, um, threading, um, FPGAs, DSPs, and the like, we can create a new execution policy for it, and the STL algorithms that understand execution policies can leverage this. So we've currently implemented this for transform, and we apply this to get burst concurrency. So you remember that um, program that we were running conventionally, to prove the central limit theorem in, or demonstrate it. In any way, we actually see, we started with an exponential distribution that does not look like a bell curve. But we ran it hundreds of billions of times and took the means of various subsets of it and we see it look like a bell curve and that was great but it just took us 15 minutes, okay? And what's the source code? We basically call transform to take a vector of experiment specifications and it is a function that calculates the mean of that experiment and writes it to a vector of means and then it outputs it as a histogram. That worked and it took 15 minutes. What if we set the policy to run in the cloud, but it's actually gonna call this same code, which is actually templated on the policy. Well, the first time I run it, we're going to get an error which says, this is, we do a lot of error checking for you and communicating on this, and this says expired token message. I haven't actually authenticated myself with the cloud provider yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Okay, now I have credentials, and now we're going to have it run 500 experiments. Each one of them is going to sample 50 million times from the exponential distribution. And uh, I'm in the wrong region. Remember, the coding is the easiest part. There we go. It took nine seconds. I didn't have to change my code. I only had to pay for um, how many cores? We can take a look. Go to the Lambda console. signing me into probably not the best region for this, but the one, but it won't take long. Okay, let's go to the Lambda console. It's 
runs much faster in the hotel, so I think it's the Wi-Fi here. But I have a function for calculating the mean of the exponential distribution. that we built the same way that I showed. Actually, I am 100% sure that's the Wi-Fi here. Um, so if we go ahead and we look at the metrics for this, uh, you can see it ran 500 experiments, and it ran all 500 of them concurrently, right? And all I did was I used the STL algorithm. Right, and a normal looking call to transform. Well, what about, there's a lot of extra functionality you expect, like what if there's an error in the lambda, right? Throwing exceptions around the cloud seems problematic, but C++23 is a solution for it. What is that solution? Right, expect it, right? That's ideal for circumstances just like this, and if you aren't using, you're all using C++23, right? I don't need to read this next bullet, do I? Okay, well, for you laggards, okay, if you aren't on C++23, there's an excellent open source implementation, um, TL expected, that um, our library can use. And as I mentioned, we'd already determined this is the right kind of approach for the cloud. Anyways, now, to maximize transparency, if your function throws an exception, right, then let's say your function doesn't return a std expected. We'll actually marshal a representation of that exception into our std expected, basically the what message and whether it was a runtime error or something like that. And then we'll rethrow it on the client side. If you do an expected as your return value, we'll just pass that. And then you can even do it differently on the client and the server. It will automatically go and figure out if it's supposed to disassemble the expected or not for you. Suppose you really did want the actual event JSON. Well, you can declare either on the client or server side that you want an invocation request. And then you can do it the traditional way. So that's still available. Now here's something I think you're all wondering, right? Right? You're thinking, was reflection added to C++ and nobody told me? Well, no it wasn't. Okay, so until there's a reflection facility, serializing data over the wire will be interesting, right? And um, we've made serialization pluggable. That's not true today, but it will be this weekend. Um, but if we had you have to plug in a serializer, well, that was a big part of what made using remote functions a lot harder. Than, um, um, than local functions. We do provide a default. Is anyone familiar with the Alpaca serialization library? Okay, I came across this recently and it's amazing, right? You're gonna come back today and tell your friend, I went to this talk and I heard about the Alpaca serialization library. <laughs> right, right, like that's the high point. Unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss it here, but you can look it up. And what it does is it uses Finney and structured bindings 
to figure out how many fields are in any type that's made up as an aggregate or containing standard library containers. And it serializes and deserializes them with zero boilerplate, right? So it uses Finney to figure out the arity of the aggregate. And then it uses structured binding to, and the auto on them to pull all the fields out of it. So mostly it just worked and works, and that's why I didn't need to mess with it. Now, there is a reality check here, and I started on this, which is, you know, not only do we only partially support two of hundreds of services, but Alpaca, you know, it's, it's a valiant workaround, but there are a lot of edge cases with it. We really need real reflection before it's great. Even then, only passing by value is likely to be supported. Fortunately, these new C++ aligned languages like Val are showing that you don't give up very much by passing by value. The concurrency is somewhat wonky. That only worked because I directly passed the lambda function to transform. Suppose I passed a C++ lambda that wraps a AWS lambda. Well, then it won't get the right overload. Um, cloud applications require more than just code. They need deployments, roles, et cetera, if you like. And we do not provide any simplification for that, although you can use other tools for simplifying that, like the cloud development kit. And you know, there's work being done by Alot over there on things like the wing language to automate that. And you can use all of that, but it's still a big part of the job and we didn't address it. So what's next? First thing is mitigate those reality checks. Short terms, new services and features, leverage more of the modern C++ language features, right? Like std execution is something I'd love to get in there for the best asynchronous support. Medium term, improve tooling. In long term, improve the language. So here's an example of something we'll have new, soon with new service support. So we could think of a NoSQL database as a key value map in the cloud. So, and lambdas shouldn't just be callable, they should be triggerable. So if you want to update a map in the cloud, every time a file's updated into an S3 bucket, you should be able to pipe the bucket into the lambda and then detach the pipeline. And it's deployed. So that's a near-term thing, which I think is pretty cool. There's obviously many other things. Um, we want to use C++ 26 and other modern features like std execution. We want to have asynchrony with ranges. Um, how do we work around the lack of execution policies and ranges? I'm interested in ideas there. The C++ tool chains designed for building an executable, not assembling apps out of managed services. What if we mod modified your operating system's linker, your tool chain's linker, to be able to link in cloud functions and services and assemble your entire app? What about tooling to automate the deployment and roles and the like? So finally, there's a slide that had some problems. Right, ultimately distributed systems like threading require language support. There's a famous paper of Hans Bohm's called Threads Cannot Be Implemented as a Library. So the cloud will also benefit from language support eventually. Um, we've talked about serialization, we've talked about range. Is 
Um, we've talked about maybe the cloud is hidden, so we'd like the lambda, the AWS Lambda and your C++ Lambda to get promoted into the cloud and the like. All of this is doable and the end result will be that the cloud provides valuable services that programs can take advantage of, abstractions can make cloud programming easier, there's much more to come, and we do believe in some sunny future, a few years from now, cloud programming will just be a normal way to program, as easy as thread programming or any other kind. Thank you very much. Do we have time for some questions? Yeah, so I, that's what I said, is we currently don't do the deployment for you. And that's why I said it would be great to have better tool chain support. So I used AWS Lambda deploy from the command line to deploy it. I compiled that program. Well, I, compi uh, I compiled it two programs, one with the implementation and one with the call. The implementation one, I used AWS Lambda deploy to deploy to the cloud and the calling program I ran on my computer. Um, for people who didn't hear, the question was, how did that function ever make it into the cloud? No, no, here's the actual code that, um, that I ran. It's a little small, sorry. Um, not quite sure. I think that made it a little bigger. So what I did is I wrote the function in C++. I put in that handler line. I compiled it and then ran a script that packaged it and uploaded it to the cloud. I thought that we also saw this uh, uh, definition of add in the, in the other statement. I think you mean the bind in the uh, client. Yeah, the client simply said, go ahead, here I use the macro to say, oh, okay. well, it bind it to the AWS Lambda of this name. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, uh, you talked about serialization. From your perspective, does it matter to what to be serialized? Do you need it to be serialized to JSON? Does it matter if you serialize it binary? Uh, is, there, is, that, is there a preference? In the, yeah, so the question is what's the desirable um, wire format for the serialization. And um, AWS Lambdas expect JSON, so I serialize it to binary, and then I base 64 encode it. So it's about as efficient as you can possibly do it in JSON. But if you had different remote procedure call protocols, you know, hopefully you could have different ways of doing it. So if we had, uh, say, we, say we have reflection, from your perspective, it would be great if we have a reflection directly to JSON because it will save uh, that on the wire and uh, it would be easier for you. Yes, yeah, so the question is that reflection, you know, what would you do then? You could have reflection serialized to JSON, and that would be good for debugging, but it's not a very efficient format. So even then, I'd like to 
serialize it to binary format, and then if necessary, base64 encode the binary format. The, um, I think the analogy to it is if you're using thrift, you can choose whether it does JSON serialization or binary serialization. So I'd love to have that be configurable for readability versus performance. But right now I just want reflection. Okay, there was one question in back there. Um, there are some limitations. They're not that bad. Um, the most serious limitation is you don't have a lot of control of the hardware because this is serverless. So you can't really tell the lambda that you want this many cores or um, you want a GPU or things like that, like you can with a, a cloud-based server like an EC2 instance. You do get to have a single scaling number that scales up memory and core and all of those things. So I actually gave my statistics example with way more memory than it needed just to encourage it to provision more cores. So I think being able to have more control over the hardware is um, probably the biggest limitation because I know sometimes I want it to spin up a whole bunch of machines with GPUs and I don't know how to do that right now. Um, it is stateless and it'll rerun on the same machine. So yes, yeah, static variables are problematic. Um, I don't find that to be a big problem for me. As I said, the bigger problem is figuring out how to properly size the machine it runs on. But for you, the limitations may matter, and we should probably document exactly what they are, and probably we have for the C++ runtime. But I don't know it off the top of my head. So that's a good question. All right, um, I think we're at the end of the time. I can take questions outside if anybody has any more questions. And again, thank you very much and check it out.